All right, and welcome back to part three of this week's Yawa, where we are going to answer a few questions for you. If you haven't watched yet, go back and watch part one and two of this week. And for those of you that are listening, uh, you've probably already listened if you're this far, so. (laughs) And I just wanted to mention, because it's kind of a new process, that we are taking all of the questions that we are answering from YouTube comments on our previous Yawa videos. So if you are wanting your question answered next week, you need to be thrown in the comments below. If you're wanting your questions answered tonight or tomorrow, you need to be signing up on Patreon, patreon.com slash standingstonekennels, where you can answer, ask us questions, and we will answer them on the daily. Speaking of Patreon, we are getting so close to... 300 patrons. Which is so awesome. You guys, the patrons are the ones that are allowing us to get cool video equipment, like our new drone. So if you haven't seen our new hunting dog health, getting your dog in shape for hunting season video, where we featured the new drone footage, um, you should definitely be checking that out. Yes. And as well in that video, I show our step-by-step, maybe not necessarily what you should be doing with your dogs, but it probably wouldn't hurt them to follow along with our prep for the hunting season schedule. And that is a really good segue into some of our questions because a lot of people watched that video and then they had questions for you about that process. Bring them on, bring them on. Bring them on. So this was a good question and I don't think we actually mentioned it in the video from Ashley Smith. Do you do this in the morning or evening when it's cooler out? I ask because when I run my dog for 10 minutes when it's 80 plus out, he will be wobbling and almost falling over. So I won't let him Too hot. run only a few minutes when it's warm. Any advice? Wobbling and almost falling over. You have gone too far, dear. Or yes. sir. Ashley is a Ashley is probably name. a boy. Okay. Ashley. I'm, but I don't know. That could be a bad assumption. Yeah. Either way. So. Person. You have gone too far. You need to be reading those signs and or preparing and or preventing any of those things from happening in the future. Now, as far as our dogs, we're pretty much doing it first thing in the morning. Um, Zoe, one of our trainers and assistant trainers, is uh, pretty much in charge of the roading regiment. And uh, she does a great job. And all of that happens first thing back at dawn. And so as far as temperatures, it's usually 70s or Right now, this time of year is probably mm-hmm. low 70s when they're I think running. It was, yeah, I think and, it was in the 60s this morning, but it was cool. Yeah, but a lot of times it's not over the mid 70s and cloudy. Definitely not in the 80s. Yeah, definitely not 80 plus, And that's mm-hmm. not nope. the time that we would be running the dogs. So Good question, though. Good question. question. And definitely one that when we shoot another conditioning, hunting dog health, roading video, we'll make sure to put that in that specific video because I'm thinking that that's a question that's going to get asked a lot. Could be. What do we have next? We have another question from TJ. TJ. I have a seven-year-old GSP that I can't put weight on. To keep this short, I have tried everything for weight gain health checks. I'm worried about his health as he looks sickly after a weekend of hunting from losing weight he can't afford to. That suggested a round of anabolic steroids to see how he does. Do you have any experiences or advice with going this route? Probably seven weeks. Seven years old. Seven years. Yes. Okay. So um, obviously we don't have all of the information, don't have enough information to give exactly what, you know, we think could be going on. But a few things that I wanted to mention is um, definitely if your vet's making recommendations, they've had their eyes on your dog. They are, you know, have tons of experience and training and learning to- Years of schooling. Make those recommendations. And we are just- Average Joes that have seen a dog or two, seen a dog or two, but we are not vets. My first question would be, what are you feeding? That is my, my number one, two. And how much are you feeding? Yep. If you've done the vet checks, I'm assuming then we don't have worms. We don't have anything on blood work that shows up. That's abnormal. Those would be some pretty standard things. As far as like, you know, thyroid, because thyroid is, can be off on a dog and they need thyroid medication. Yep. So those are typically some of the things we look at, um, as well as amount of food, type of food. Um, I know that fat and protein is a huge part of dog food. So making sure you're feeding a high fat and protein diet would be important and food feeding at least, at least the recommended amount of food as well. So I don't know what they're eating. TJ definitely throw us a response in there or hit us up on Patreon where we can get back to you. 
uh, before next week. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention is you don't mention if they are neutered or not, but definitely neutering dogs slows down their metabolism as well. I know that has happened for Nick's, our male who's eight. Mm -hmm. Um, He was neutered and he went from a harder keeper where he definitely is using everything we're giving him to maintain weight, especially during hunting season to an easy keeper. He does a combination of the, the neutering aspect of things. And then probably just getting older is the the double whammy there. Yep. But definitely, um, that's another thing to consider is, you know, that metabolism could slow down a little bit if he is neutered. So lots of other information that we need in order to be able to give you enough feedback on that question. Okay. So on to the next question. What have we got? Um, there was a good one about collar conditioning. Here it is ooh, ooh, ooh. from Emily Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. Our GSP puppy is 16 weeks old. Okay. We laid the groundwork with positive reinforcement for recall, clicker plus nice. treat, until he started getting very confident around two weeks ago when we introduced his e-collar following your suggested steps for introduction. The first week and a half was great. He would recall every time with vibrate. Starting a few days ago, however, he will not listen to the vibrate at all. Uh We have tried low-level stimulus, and he ignores this as well. When he is ignoring the collar, he is sniffing or just running happily around me. We have done done his collar training outdoors in an open field with limited distractions for the most part. Is this to be expected with his age, or could something else be going on? And I thought that this was a really good question because it sounds... Very similar to Thunder. Oh, it's Thunder to a T. And so we did Thunder's introduction to e-collar training um, with Vibrate. and Shot a video of that. Shot a video of Looked that. Looked fantastic. Yep. He responded really, really well. And then in the next week or so, he started getting even more bold and even more confident and more distracted and listening with Vibrate. Not at all. Pretty much not. And, um, it definitely, it sounds like you're doing everything right in the sense of using some stimulation. Just keep in mind that the collar fit is important. So it needs to be snug enough that he's consistently feeling that stimulation. Um, so proper collar fit and then throwing a check cord on your puppy is also not a bad idea. Even when you think you're in a low distraction environment, it sounds like you're in an open field. So if you start using some stimulation and he doesn't respond immediately or, you know, he gets a little unsure of what's going on, having that attachment to him via a check cord so he isn't just running around willy nilly will allow you to redirect his focus. Absolutely. The other side of it that I can say as far as collar conditioning aspect of things would just be finding a level that's going to pull focus. Yes. So that you're was saying my next you're saying you're lose you're using low levels of stem and the thing that people get wrapped up on is that number, okay? So that number means nothing. It really does not. We need to find whatever level that the dog is going to respond to, whatever pulls their focus in that specific situation, and it's going to be different. High distraction, higher the level. Low distraction, lower level. And we and need every to, dog is different too. Yeah, 100%, which is why the numbers mean nothing. So you have dog A, they respond on a 9. You have dog B. They respond on a two. It doesn't really matter. Use whatever level, go up until you see, okay, I hit that Nick button. That's typically what we would use is a tap the continuous or use your momentary button, tap, tap. And that's a really nice thing about DT systems collars is they have vibrate as an individual button. They have continuous as an individual button and they have Nick as an individual button. So you don't have to rotate through cycles. You don't have to do anything else. It's very simple, very easy to use. Um, and that's all the colors that we use is DT systems. So, um, but you would hit your Nick button tap. Uh, he didn't, he didn't acknowledge any of that. Go up a little bit, Nick, go up a little bit, Nick, go up a little, Nick. There he is. He turned his head a little bit, saw something, pulled his focus. Hey, 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 now we've got his attention away from whatever he was doing. Hit vibrate. You're going to see that recall just like he wanted. If you lose focus on the way back, veers off. Nick button again, pull focus back to you. Hey, 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 Sparky, you get a name? No. Okay, Sparky, vibrate here, finish that out. And then you've got uh, a more consistent situation. He's going to learn 
If he just responds to vibrate, he can avoid the stimulation, which in this case is being used as positive punishment or adding punishment to the situation when he doesn't first respond to that mild negative reinforcement of the vibrate. Yes. So we actually also have a video out using Legend. It's from a while ago when he was quite a bit younger talking about vibration versus stimulation. And that would be a good resource if you haven't seen that video already, as well as I know we mention it all the time, but if you're really struggling, throw in a video up on our online dog training community on Patreon and getting some feedback from us being able to actually get our eyes on the situation and say, hey, this is how you can handle that situation would be a really good option. Absolutely. So thank you for the question. All right. Next question from Justin Perniski. Hey, Justin. Hey, guys. Maybe a Yawa. Yawa. That's what we're doing with it. What age do you guys recommend starting roading? I have read anywhere from six months to 18 months. I know it depends on breed growth rate, but do you have a good rule of thumb? Also, for younger dogs that growth plates aren't fully developed but have a lot of energy, what would be a good option before roading or treadmill workouts? Thanks for all of these. I'm going to be getting a poodle pointer this coming spring, so I'm asking Excited. as much info as I can digest. I love it. So the roading thing is, and you're going to hear that a lot. I mean, that's going to be probably the most consistent thing that you hear from individual unique dog trainers is that they are in, they are very consistently inconsistent. Um, if you ask, a, I've heard multiple people say, if you ask a hundred dog trainers, you get a hundred answers and they'll all be different. So it's, it's one of those things that ideally the more mature the dog is, our rough demand number is going to be 12 plus months. So if they fall into that. You're usually structurally closer to mature but I don't think that growth plates completely close up or completely to that point until after two or something to that effect, 26 months. And I'm sure it depends on the breed of the dog, you know, those larger yeah. breed dogs and things like that. Those growth plates are going to take longer to close where if you've got a little breed dog, um, you may not be roading them, but they're going to close quicker. Yep. So ultimately the closer we can get to maturity, the better. And then as far as you have a wound up pup, you need to burn some steam off treadmilling or a little bit of roading is okay, but it's got to be pretty minimal. And what we're trying to do is prevent over uh, abundance of trauma to those bones during that important development stage. Yeah. And when we talk about roading, the way that our roading rig is set up, it's not so much about pulling. There is a little pulling, but mm -hmm. it's not like sled dog pulling. It's no. more of a pacing, a little bit of pulling. Um, it's kind of like just controlled running. Yes. Definitely. So that's one thing to keep in mind as well when you're setting up maybe your own roading rig, um, that it's not necessarily about the pull. And another thing that you can do for burning off steam is, you know, free running the dogs. Um, free running is going to be a little safer, but then probably most importantly out of all of the things is going to be more mental stimulation. Um, doing training type events and sessions that challenge your dog mentally is going healing, to be yes. healing, healing. Once your puppy is over six months old and they're super independent in the field, work a lot on that obedience. That's going to be very mentally taxing for that puppy. Yep. And you'll see just as big of benefits, um, if not more sometimes from a mentally exhausted pup as you will from a physically exhausted pup. They don't seem to uh, bounce back as quickly from a mental exhaustion standpoint. And uh, especially in the early stages of that. But if you have plans to take them further in training, they need you need to start growing that brain uh, early or they give you a lot more pushback. Yeah, because a little bit of stress, so expecting your puppy to lay on a dog bed for longer is going to help them grow because stress is important for growth. And if they can stay on a dog bed for a longer duration through more distractions, that's another mentally taxing exercise that you can do with your puppy at home um, that's not going to risk growth plates or anything like that. Yeah. So like Kat said, stress is extremely important, just like it is for any other growth, things like muscle development. You start working your muscles, they break down a little bit, they get sore, they grow back. You stress them too much, they break, they take a long time to fix that. So keep that in mind when you're working with your dogs, it's going to be the same. You push them too far, it's going to take a long time to fix those things. Good question. 
probably have time for one or two more. Yeah, this is a good one. Um, and something that I don't think that we always talk about from PM Doran 100. How do you do deal with a female dog's period? We waited to have our current dog spayed. Unless we keep a diaper on her, there are drops everywhere. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Learning a lot from you both. So we have been asked a ton. This was actually on one of our Yawas from a long time ago with Peter, who we actually talked about in part one. Yes. So, um, Peter, Peter. Yes. He is a veterinarian and we talked about, you know, when to spay or neuter and we recommended and he recommended and we talked about it waiting until the dog's females are about a year or have had their first heat cycle. So to get through that, obviously you have to deal with a heat cycle. Well, what do you do? Diaper. That's pretty much your, your option. Yeah. They make a uh, puppy, um, panties. panties basically. And you can put a little panting liner in it and it collects most of the blood that way. And uh, just remember to take them off before you send them outside to go to the bathroom. Aside from that, they're going to bleed everywhere. And we have the ability that a lot of times they end up just getting a little less uh, house access during that time. And some of the other dogs get rotated up in another position. Yep. But puppy panties and um, to mention, females go through heat cycles typically twice a year, every six months. Um, not everybody knows that. And we have been dealing with dogs for so long that it kind of becomes second nature that we're like, oh yeah, heat cycles every six months. Um, but not everybody knows that. So once your female goes through a heat cycle, if you're not planning on breeding her, it would be healthier for her to go ahead and get spayed. Um, you won't have to worry about things like pyometras and, um, developing cancer and things like that. Accidental breedings. That as well. Um, so she's had her first heat cycle. You got to deal with it once, then go ahead and make the decision um, to go ahead and get her spayed. And that's going to be healthier for her overall, as well as you're not going to have to worry about heat cycles in the house and doggy diapers and panties and things like that. So Absolutely. This was another good question from Isaac Turton. Aha. Hey there, longtime fan. I know during formal training, it is best to not do other activities that can distract or take away from that training, such as dog parks later in the day or fun fetching. What other activities do you recommend to do with your dog that will stimulate them throughout the day when you are not training? You got this, babe. Okay. So, uh, yes, when we're working on specific formal training tasks, for example, if we're working on formal woe training, I'm not taking the dog to the field for the opportunity to point birds because I have no way to reinforce what I'm trying to be working on right now with that formal woe training. Um, same with formal retrieving. If we're working on formal retrieving work, we're not going to be playing fun fetch in the backyard because the naughty habits that we're doing that formal retrieving work to correct are just going to come out and then it's going to make your training process a lot more difficult. It's going to take a little bit more time, things like that. Yes. I would also say, um, there are other instances where working on fun things, then your dog can potentially hold out during those training sessions that might not be as enjoyable. I mean, it's formal work. It's taking a lot of obedience into account and those dogs. That's a pretty pukey behavior. I mean, it's a pretty pukey behavior, but it happens. And I think that people overlook that kind of thing. It's like, oh, well, I'll do something fun for them to enjoy. Well, part of it is helping them to understand that they can enjoy the formal work aspect of it too. But if you're constantly, you know, putting Brussels sprouts on the table and feeding them cookies after dinner, whether they really ate it or not, they're never going to learn to eat the Brussels sprouts. So Yeah. So we want to make sure that I'm they- I'm getting a bunch of comments right now, right after that statement, they're coming in. Who eats Brussels sprouts? I hate Brussels sprouts. Nobody eats Brussels sprouts. I love Brussels sprouts. I like them. We have a really awesome recipe for Brussels sprouts actually with bacon and apples mm-hmm. on the trigger. That's a Kayla special. Mm-hmm. Good. Yes. Kayla taught us this one and we uh, use it probably- too Every much. time we have pork chops, yeah. it's my like go-to side for pork, pork chops. chops brush or brush. So keep in mind that um, when you're working on some of these formal tasks, you don't have to make everything else super duper fun. You can work on other obedience tasks as well. So if you're working on formal woe training or formal retrieving, I, all that formal training I am talking about has a ton of obedience-based behaviors Absolutely. that we're working on. So work on other obedience tasks like place training and healing as well. 
Um, like we talked about before, those are all very mentally taxing as well. So you actually might not need to do as much as you think because your dog's brain is working really hard to process everything that they're learning through formal woe training, formal, um, you know, retrieving training, all of those things. And they might not be able to handle as much as you're trying to throw at them brain overload and giving them some time off. You know, it says like on days that you're not training, giving dogs a couple days off to percolate on what they've learned. They come back fresher, more willing to work. Um, it's almost like that time off helped you get further in your training. We've seen it before. We've seen it um, with legend, regular. legend yeah. currently when we're doing his trained retrieve sessions, um, that we've got a series going out now, uh, he doesn't get worked every single day. He gets time to process what we've worked on. And then we come back the next time and he does much better and improves on what we've already taught him. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself, which is why he left me to answer that one pretty much on my own. <laughs> Uh, folks, that's all we've got time for this week. We appreciate everybody that threw comments in the comment section, questions for this Yawa. And we want encourage you, if you have questions for us and we didn't get to yours this week, to either throw it in the comments for next week or hit us up on Patreon. I am the guy with the pink gun. And I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. And we'll see you in the next video.